We're joined now by Aaron Ford, the CEO of Arrivo. Aaron, thank you very much for coming into us. La earlier this year, Aaron, Arrivo reported very strong financial performance for the year 2017, even though it was a volatile year. Um, but 2018 has been an even more volatile year and we've seen lots of different extreme weather events. Um, can you give any sort of projections on how you expect those figures to tally in April 2019? So, thanks Claire. 2017 was a good year for Revo. Uh, 2018 will certainly be remembered as a year of volatility. Volatility in weather and volatility in commodity prices. That's been true for Revo. Uh, 2018 won't be as strong a year as 2017 but we will continue our track record of, of a strong performance. And that strong performance as a cooperative is measured in two ways. Paying a good relative milk price to our, to our milk suppliers. And for eight of the last 10 years, we have paid the strongest milk price in the northern half of the country to our milk suppliers in Arrivo. But also having a strong, sustainable cooperative there with a strong balance sheet. So 2018 won't be as good as 17, but it will be a good year for Arrivo. So they're the main strategies in terms of insulating against market volatility. So we, I suppose our first strategy against insulating, uh, for insulating against volatility is to pay a good milk price to our, to our members. Secondly, to have a strong balance sheet in the co-op that they own so that the business that they own and they depend on to process and market their milk is in, is in a position to do that and to invest in its future. Um, outside of that, we do run fixed milk price schemes for, for our milk suppliers and we have three running. We have just uh, launched fixed milk price scheme four. There's various levels of uptake. They're all voluntary. Some of them have worked out very well. Some of them have worked out not so well. Um, fixed milk price schemes really, they need to be of a duration that nobody wins or loses, either the customer or the farmer, that hopefully they break out about even for everybody. Uh, so that at the end, people can say, look, I got stability in my pricing, whether that's a customer or the farmer. Uh, and that's important to them, depending on where they are in their cash flow cycle and investment cycle. Erin, you have very deep roots um, in the Western region, especially with the, with the co-ops, the cooperative model there. Do you still think the cooperative model is sustainable? Um, I work most of my work in life in cooperatives of one form or another and for the last 15 years in Arrivo in the west of Ireland. Um, I think uh, if the cooperative wasn't a feature of the west of Ireland uh, and rooting back into the, the 40 or so communities that we touch up and down the west and northwest, I'm not sure who would replace us to, to do the job that the cooperative owned by its farmers would do. Uh, we have a tremendous impact on communities. We bring back um, hundreds of millions annually in, in wages and in milk payments uh, back into those communities. So it is a model that works. Uh, it's a model that, that injects cash into parishes up and down uh, rural Ireland. And uh, I think it's one as it adapts to the future will, will continue to be successful. Where do you see milk price going over the next year to 24 months? So I think this year has been one of volatility, mainly driven by weather events, but not, not exclusively, also by geopolitical events. Um, the, the China US um, trade dynamics that, that are going on are having somewhat of an impact. Oil prices have risen strongly. That hasn't translated into milk prices as yet. Um, one would have to remain hopeful that it will. We're in a difficult phase now. Most of the milk price in Ireland for the last 18 months, two years, has been made up, uh, driven by butter, the high price of butter, at historic um, historic highs. That looks now to be to be plattering and, and coming into a more normalised situation. One would hope, uh, as we transition into 2019, that some of the the dynamics that are there will will tilt back in the supply in the supplier and the farmer's favour and that we'll see more stability in milk pricing for 2019. Another big challenge coming down the track is the environmental measures and environmental regulations, uh, particularly on the dairy side. And in the last few days, EU Commissioner for Agriculture and Rural Development, Phil Hogan, has warned yet again that the dairy sector may, may have to face a quota system based on carbon emissions in the future. What do you make of those sorts of warnings, Aaron? And, and what would you say to your suppliers? 
So I think we all have a responsibility to mine the planet and mine the environment and leave it at least as good as we found it. Uh, and we take that very seriously in Arevo and I think as an industry here in Ireland. We saw David Attenborough's warning at the, the world leaders meeting in Poland yesterday about you know the end of civilization as we know it. Um, within that, Ireland has, has carbon emissions uh, targets which we're currently exceeding. Sort of counter to that, we are still the most carbon efficient place to produce milk and beef on the planet. Uh, and one wonders, you know, how, how the two of those things sit together. The fact that we produce enough dairy and beef to feed nine or 10 times our population and we are more carbon efficient, has that been properly adequately addressed in setting our carbon targets? I'm not so sure that it has. Nonetheless, we have that responsibility to the planet. In Arevo, we take it very seriously. We have resources invested in sustainability, uh, in lean, in a farm profitability program to drive uh, uh, improvement in our operations, uh, to drive out cost and, and to make our operations more energy efficient. So it is something we're taking very, very seriously and, and on a road of continuous improvement in. Do you think expansion is sustainable on the rates at which it's continuing at the moment? I think Ireland has the potential to produce a lot more milk. Uh, as I said at the outset, the fact that we're one of the most carbon efficient or the most carbon efficient producer of milk on the planet um, probably isn't taken account of in, in the greenhouse gas emission targets that we have. Uh, if that milk is to be, production of that milk and beef is to be sacrificed here in Ireland, it will be produced ultimately somewhere that's less carbon efficient. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So I think there is potential to grow our milk supply while at the same time trying to improve our, our carbon footprint at the farm level and at the processing entity level. Arevo has a very strong record of consolidating with, um, with businesses. Earlier this year, uh, you showed some interest in the Lockpatrick merger at the time. Do you think there is further consolidation in the market for Arevo and where do you see that coming in? So this week, Claire, we're launching a book called Fields of Gold. It's 575 pages. It starts back 150 years ago in the era of the Land League uh, and pre-cooperatives. And it charts the history of cooperation in the west and northwest of Ireland uh, in the dairy industry right up to the Arevo of today. And when one leaves through those 575 pages, what's abundantly clear is that process of consolidation has been going on for 150 years. It will absolutely continue uh, where it makes economic sense and where entities joining together can extract more efficiencies uh, and add more value and, and ultimately pass back something more to the member owner, the farmer. Um, we have a very open mind to all of those things in Arevo, always have and have kept a healthy dialogue with, with colleagues in the industry in that respect. And in relation to potential mergers, where do you see opportunities? Look, Ireland is a small place. Uh, there are a smaller number of cooperatives now than there were five or six years ago, and certainly than 10 years ago. If we roll the clock on 10 more years, there will be a smaller number again. Um, will Arevo be part of that? It's certainly our aim to be uh, continue the growth we've had. Um, we acquired Donegal's business in 2011. Um, we've had fantastic growth in 2009. We processed 130 million litres of milk. This year we'll process 440 million litres of milk. So it's our ambition to continue that growth, pay a good milk price to the farmers we have. And if somebody either geographically adjacent or product adjacent or whatever is interested in having a conversation with us, we're certainly open to those conversations. Demand also for your products are, is linked to oil prices, particularly in your strong export regions in the likes of Nigeria and Saudi Arabia. With oil prices rising at the moment, how does that impact on, on your prices? So we haven't seen uh, the normal reaction to oil prices of say $60, $70 a barrel where uh, you would see an uplift in dairy prices. That's because of some of the other dynamics at play. 
Um, one would hope as we journey into 2019, if that oil price rise is sustained, and we hope it will be, um, that, that that will feed through into dairy prices in the markets you spoke about, the Saudi Arabias, the Nigerias. Um, oil exporting countries account for about 30% of, of global um, dairy trade. So we'd certainly be hopeful that uh, a stronger oil price will feed into sustaining dairy prices in 2019. Are there any other markets, Aaron, that you're looking at at the moment where you see potential opportunities for Arivo? So today we export currently uh, out of our dairy business in Belladrine to about 50 countries around the globe. Um, we're constantly looking at new ones, uh, but our, our main journey is to stay relevant to the customers we have. So we've built up a suite of customers in those 50 markets and we work hard through innovation, through lean, through our people at staying relevant to that customer base uh, and, and innovating with them and growing with them together. So that's our main journey, but we, we are always exploring new market opportunities, particularly uh, Africa, the Middle East, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We're also just a few days out from this critical vote on the Brexit withdrawal agreement. Um, although Arivo don't have a huge market share in the UK, um, you do supply Northern Ireland. Um, but what is your response to, what, what, how do you think the bre hard Brexit vote could impact on the dairy industry? Look, Brexit, uh, is an unwanted, uh, an unwanted uh, issue for Ireland. Um, every household in the UK will be worse off after Brexit. Every household in Ireland will be worse off after Brexit, no matter what form it comes in. A hard Brexit will just accentuate that. We hope there won't be a hard Brexit. Uh, Ireland Inc. exports 25, 26, 27 percent of its milk to the UK in the form of cheddar cheese and butter. Uh, the tariff uh, on that is an un on cheddar is an unimaginable 1,670 euros a ton, uh, which effectively takes us out of the game. So new markets have to be found for that milk effectively, either in cheddar or in other farms. And, and various people have made announcements about diversification, etc. Uh, and I think that you know that will happen and that will that will proceed over time successfully we, we've overcome challenges in the industry before and we'll overcome this one um as to what what will happen in the coming weeks your guess is as good as mine it's very difficult to predict at this point Aaron, earlier this summer you announced a new 48 million euro investment program in arivo and you're looking at you've outlined different areas where that investment um will be targeted one of them which is uh, homeland.ie which actually launched this week can you tell me a little bit about homeland.ie and why you've decided to venture into the online market so homeland is the brand for our agribusiness uh business unit. Um, it has a, a feed mill producing 150 odd thousand tonnes of feed, Balladrine and Roscommon, and 34 retail, physical retail stores up and down the west and northwest of Ireland. Homeland.ie is our 35th store effectively, with a good strong team that have been 18 months building uh, towards yesterday when it launched. Um, we're very excited about it. I've never ceased to be amazed by the people, the profile, age, etc. of people who are shopping online. Uh, so from our point of view as an agribusiness and supplier into farming, we have absolutely got to be online and have the best agri retail site in Ireland. And we believe we're there. Um, and hopefully it will do very, very well for us. Because consumer trends, as you say, are changing and, and that can't be ignored. So there's a younger demographic in farming. Uh, but even people of uh, an age one mightn't expect to be online shopping are online shopping. But that younger demographic are doing a lot of business on the phone day in, day out when they have five minutes or half an hour quiet on the farm during the day. They're checking stuff, uh, checking out stuff on various sites and then they'll order in the evening. So we absolutely have to be online. We have a very strong physical presence. We certainly won't be shrinking back from that. 34 stores up and down the West and Northwest. Uh, but we have farmers and board members who are saying to us, 
where's our online store? And we absolutely have to be online. And so what types of products will be available on it? So our focus is agri products. Um, agri in the main, we want to be the, the best agri retailer. We're not competing with Amazon selling power tools, um, but we want to be the best at agri. So all your agri needs can be, can be bought through homeland.ie. Great. Well, Aaron, thank you very much for coming into us. And of course, Homeland is the sponsor of Farmland. And uh, we wish you all the best with that new venture.